Thank you for joining me today for Forever Friends, the Buchanan Girl Scouts. My name is Susan Ruth, and I love researching and writing about remarkable women. This project is about eight women who grew up in Buchanan, Michigan in the early 1900s. Two years ago, I was back in Buchanan for the Buck Teens reunion. I stopped by the library to say hello to Meg, the Buchanan District Library's director, and Peter, the archivist, and head of the local history room. Then I spotted the 2022 calendar with the Girl Scouts on the cover. I recognized Dode Peck, my grandmother's younger sister. I wondered, who are the other seven women? What are their stories? I will share with you today some of what I learned about them over the past two years. Today would not have been possible without the support of many people. They include Meg, who invited me to share my research with you, Peter, for his invaluable assistance with the treasures in the local history room, including diaries and photographs that belong to the Girl Scouts, as well as the Berrien County record. All the thoughtful Girl Scout families and people who knew these eight women and shared diaries, photographs, scrapbooks, and stories with me. My good friend Eileen, who found these Girl Scout families who shared such wonderful things with me. The Buck Teen organizer, Kathy Swem, who identified the roles of these eight women in every single Buck Teen reunion program from 1955 to 1984. And my dear husband, who is always supportive of my interest in writing. This story begins in 1909 in the village of Buchanan population 1800. Dr. Lester Peck has decorated the family car in preparation for the autumn homecoming parade. Dode Peck, the future instigator of the Girl Scouts, sits on his left near one of the flags. My grandmother sits under the parasol. Helen Wells, future Girl Scout, invites her friend Lita Boyer another future Girl Scout, to her ninth birthday party. Helen lives on a farm on Portage Prairie, five miles south of Buchanan, so the party will be held at her grandmother's house in town. We are fortunate that Lita saved her invitation in her scrapbook, and her family shared it with me. This is the 1910 Buchanan school photo for grades five through nine. Notice how the girls are all squeezed together. Their close friendship has already taken hold. Notice also how few students there are in these five grades. The girls, as they always called themselves, are growing up in a small village that is undergoing many changes. Their personal lives will undergo dramatic changes as well over the next 10 years. Four of them will lose a parent during their teenage years. World War I will take away most of the young men in town and half of the Girl Scouts will leave the Buchanan area for college and move to other cities. By 1910, Buchanan already has telephones, electricity, a central water system, and a lively downtown with several groceries, one owned by Jacob Arney, Girl Scout Eileen Arney's father, two hat shops, a hardware store, and three ice cream stores. For entertainment, Buchanan has a baseball team, a 40-piece band, a roller skating rink, and Rouse Opera House that hosts performances by both local citizens and out-of-town entertainers. George R. Rich Manufacturing is continuing to move to Buchanan from Chicago. Oscar Fredrickson, father of Esther Fredrickson, yet another Girl Scout, is leading that effort he is also busy inventing a new special new twist drill that will become an important product for a new Buchanan-based company. Joseph Richards, Girl Scout Daisy Richards' father, operates Zinc Collar Pads Company with his brother, the third generation to run the company. Girl Scout Lita Boyer's father is considering a career change from blacksmith to machinist as cars begin to replace horses and carriages. Girls across the country are also changing, becoming more active in camping, hiking, and sports. 
that had been reserved primarily for boys. Women are fighting for their right to vote and are becoming more outspoken about their life choices. Into this setting, as Dode Peck and her friends become teenagers, she proposes they form a Girl Scout troop. She gathers her friends together in her father's barn. It had been home to Dr. Peck's horse and buggy, but it now stores his automobile at night. She suggests that the girls form a Girl Scout troop patterned after the Boy Scouts. They all agree, although some may have been more interested in the friendship than the outdoor activities. They line up to have their pictures taken in Buchanan's photograph studio, holding their Girl Scout banner. From left to right, the girls are Doris Peck, known as Dode, Esther Fredrickson, Helen Wells, Mildred Merritt, Daisy Richards, Marjorie Sparks, Lita Boyer, and Aileen Arney. These eight girls stayed friends throughout their lives. They supported each other during the joys and tragedies of life. For the rest of our time together, I will share stories about them as individuals with different interests and lives and as a group that met regularly for more than 70 years. Dode Peck was the original ringleader who always wanted to play outside. Dode was born a twin and her twin brother died when he was only two years old. Like her three siblings, she adored her father, Dr. Lester Peck, who was the town doctor and my great-grandfather. He died when she was 15 years old, and the family was fortunate that he had made real estate investments and purchased stock in the new Clark Equipment Company. Her mother, Maud Peck, kept the family home together after her husband's early death. Maud was one of the original members of the 30 Club, a group of 30 women who came together to study literature, the arts, and world events. Dode taught herself to play the piano, although she never learned to read music. After high school, Dode was restless. She had several jobs in Buchanan, playing the piano at the Princess Theater for Silent Movies, reporting for the Berrien County Record, and writing the Buchanan Social News column for the South Bend Tribune. She also dabbled at universities. She attended the University of Michigan, the University of Colorado in Denver, and Northwestern University. As a single woman, she loved to explore new places, often with family or friends. She regularly wrote letters home to her mother on hotel or ship stationery. When Dode accompanied silent movies at the Prince's Theater, her piano was in the orchestra pit. She couldn't easily see the screen, so she just played whatever she felt like. Marjorie Sparks told her close friend Dode that she loved movies but couldn't go to afford to go very often. Dode had a solution. She told the manager that she needed someone to turn the pages of her sheet music, and Marjorie would be ideal. As Marjorie turned the pages, she could also see the moving pictures for free. Dode played by ear, of course, and didn't even own any sheet music. She purchased a few sheets of music so Marjorie could be seen turning pages. The system worked. Marjorie served another important role. Dode couldn't see the screen from where she sat in the orchestra pit, but Marjorie could. She would whisper to Dode that she needed to switch music to match the story on the screen. No longer would Dode play a jazz tune during a funeral scene. Dode is shown here during one of her adult hiking trips. She even went down the Colorado River on a rafting and camping tour when she was 65 years old. She had to get doctor's permission to do that tour. As a teen, Dode gathered the Girl Scouts for local adventures, as seen by this newspaper article. Following the trail of the pioneer, and in true pioneer fashion, the Girl Scouts, accompanied by Miss Mary Peck, who was Dode's aunt, had a steak fry Friday evening on the banks of the old St. Joe. Dode married George Schumacher, an MIT engineering graduate, when she was 30 years old, a late marriage at that time. 
Her scrapbook mentions an earlier engagement to a Navy pilot friend of her brother, who graduated from Annapolis. We don't know why that engagement ended, but suspect he may have been killed in service to his country. George's father, like Dode's uncle, was a doctor in Denver. Dode and George probably met through family connections. They married in Cleveland and lived there for the rest of their lives. They raised two children and enjoyed five grandchildren. They shared the love of travel and were just as happy in a fishing camp in Canada as they were dining with a ship captain on a luxury liner. Dode was equally content to be home playing her baby grand piano. Dode stayed close to all the Girl Scouts, but especially Marjorie Sparks Gilbert and her son Bill. Dode and Bill are shown here hugging each other at a reunion in the early 1970s. Esther Fredrickson was a first-generation American, although her mother had family roots in Michigan. Esther was born in Chicago, where her father, Oscar Fredrickson, a Swedish immigrant and inventor, worked for George R. Rich Manufacturing. In 1905, he was placed in charge of moving the company, the predecessor to Clark Equipment, from Chicago to Buchanan. He moved his family, including four-year-old Esther, with him. Esther was quickly accepted as a new friend by her peers. Esther's mother was not well, perhaps suffering from tuberculosis, and may have either stayed in Chicago with family members or moved back to Chicago for her health. She died in Chicago when Esther was only 12 years old and her father remarried soon, soon after. Esther left home and married Lawrence Cook when she was 18 years old. They owned Cook's Grocery on the main street of Galeen and had a part interest in Cook's Pharmacy as well. Esther and Lawrence raised two sons. Grandson Kevin recalls helping stock shelves at the Cook's Grocery. Both of Esther's sons fought in World War II. They are shown here with their parents, Esther and Lawrence. Eugene holding his son Jackie is on the left and Jack on the right. Esther became active in Mothers of World War II. Demonstrating her leadership skills, she was elected president of the Michigan chapter and later named National Sergeant at Arms, a distinct honor. Widowed at the age of 66, Esther remained active. She attended Girl Scout reunions, served as the Buckteens president for three years in a row, and modeled clothes for fundraisers for girls' scholarships. She was also a leading member of the Galeen Library Board. Helen Wells came from my pioneer family that settled in Portage Prairie. Her father was a farmer, and Helen spent many of her school days in town with her maternal grandmother. She was elected the Girl Scout treasurer, which was fitting because she eventually became a math teacher. These girls knew what their skill sets were very early in life. When the United States entered World War I, Helen joined the Red Cross, another early sign that she was committed to public service. She is shown here in her Girl Scout uniform. Teaching was one of the few careers available in Michigan for single women in the early 1900s. Women were required to resign if and when they married. Graduates of a two-year normal school were qualified to teach in an elementary school. Helen chose instead to go to the University of Michigan. She graduated with a degree in math with a teacher's certificate. She taught high school mathematics in Plymouth, Michigan until the early 1940s. The Depression was particularly difficult for farmers, and she and Ira Swartz, a fellow Portage Prairie farmer, felt that they did not have the money to get married. They finally wed in 1942. Helen's only child was born in 1944, a baby girl they named Martha, who died the day she was born. Helen later returned to teaching when being married was no longer a disqualification. This time, she chose to teach the upper grades 
at House School on Portage Prairie. Her students loved her and rode their bikes to her farmhouse to see her over the summer. One of Helen's students was shunned by the other girls because she didn't own a horse. When Helen discovered why the student didn't join her classmates for lunch, she intervened. We do not know what she said to the girls, but thereafter, the student joined her classmates every day at lunchtime. Helen and Ira are shown here when her farm was designated a Michigan Centennial Farm in 1973. They shared the love of the out of doors and enjoyed taking their camper on summer trips, including to Alaska, where Ira hunted. My father used to say that their living room was filled with dead, endangered species. Although that was an exaggeration, it did contain several deer heads and a couple of um, bearskin rugs. It may be my imagination, but I recall a walrus, and my brother remembers a bobcat and a moose head. As much as we all loved Helen, the living room was a bit frightening to younger children. Lita Boyer, Kent's younger son, recalls gifts of venison after each of Ira's hunting trips. When Helen passed away at the age of 89, she was still corresponding with more than 100 former students. By the end of 1980, all the Girl Scouts were widows. This photo was probably taken at Ira's memorial service. Ira's faithful dog, who always rode with him on his tractor, sits at Helen's feet. Mildred Merritt was born in Chicago, and her father was a hardware salesman. By the 1910 census, she was living in Buchanan. Her father died tragically when she was 13, and he was only 37. She moved to Niles after her freshman year in high school with her mother and two younger sisters. This picture is from Mildred's senior high school yearbook. In 1918, Mildred's mother finally received a pension based on her husband's military service. He probably fought in the Spanish-American War. In the 1920 census, Mildred's mother was listed as the head of the household working as a clerk. Mildred was a bookkeeper for the gas company. Soon thereafter, Mildred and her future husband, Aloysius Laskowski, known as Candy, appeared in the social pages of the local newspaper. Candy was a yardman for the railroad, but more importantly, the assistant to the regional manager of the Michigan Central Railroad. Mildred and Candy married in 1926. He was very quickly promoted. They began a series of moves from Niles to Michigan City, on to Detroit, before moving to New York. Although Mildred moved away from Berrien County, and even Michigan, she stayed in touch with her Girl Scout friends. Their reunion in 1937 was held at Mildred's house in Detroit. She is the woman in the dark colored dress sitting on the grass. At least one of the later reunions was held in the Laskowski's private rail car. When the Laskowski's traveled to southwestern Michigan, they attached their private car to the back of the train that ran between New York and Chicago. The car, complete with a chef, was parked at the Niles Railroad Station while Mildred and Candy visited and entertained friends in Niles and Buchanan. Lita Boyer's younger son remembers having dinner in that rail car. Mildred hosted another reunion during the 1964-65 New York World's Fair. By then, Mildred and Candy had moved to Bronxville, New York, a wealthy Westchester County enclave where President John F. Kennedy grew, grew up. Mildred and Candy had two children, a son and a daughter. When Candy retired, he was the vice president of operations for the entire New York Central Railroad system, a powerful position at that time. He had a police escort when he traveled through New York City in his limousine. Unfortunately, I have not uncovered any photos from this reunion, 
but stories shared by families who remembered the reunion said that Candy provided his limousine to take the Girl Scouts from the Laskowski home to the World's Fair. Candy passed away in 1969, but that did not slow down Mildred. One member of her family referred to her as a force of nature. She was determined to attend the last Girl Scout reunion at Helen's house in 1982, so she drove alone from New Hampshire to Buchanan to attend. That's a trip of 880 miles. Only Dode was unable to attend that reunion. Mildred is shown here in Helen's kitchen, talking with Daisy Richards, another Girl Scout who moved away from Buchanan and returned regularly to see her friends. Mildred passed away at the age of 101, the last surviving Girl Scout. Daisy Richards grew up in what is now the Swim Home at the intersection of Clark and Front Streets in Buchanan. Her great-grandfather founded zinc collar pads in Buchanan in 1870, a company that made zinc based pads for the shoulders of horses. During the early years of World War I, before the United States entered the war, her family's company supplied zinc collar pads to English, French, and Russian governments for their armies. Unfortunately, the company did not survive the transition from horses to automobiles and closed in 1925. Daisy graduated from the University of Illinois in Champaign, where she met her future husband, Roy Hill. Daisy returned to Berrien County after graduation. She lived for a year in St. Joe, Michigan, where she taught English at the high school. Her salary was $1,400. She was also the faculty advisor for the high school newspaper. This photograph is from the St. Joe High School 1923-24 yearbook, courtesy of the local history room of St. Joe's Library. When the school year ended, she apparently returned to Buchanan to live at home. Two years later, she married Roy Hill. According to a family member, Roy arrived in Buchanan a day or two before the wedding, assuming he'd be able to easily acquire a Michigan marriage license. He quickly learned that Michigan had a three-day waiting period between buying the license and the wedding. He and Daisy crossed the border into Indiana, purchased an Indiana marriage license that had no restrictions. They were legally married in a park in South Bend. That weekend, they had a formal wedding in Daisy's church in Buchanan. Daisy and Roy had two sons and lived the rest of their lives in Springfield, Illinois, where Roy was a lawyer. Daisy's daughter-in-law told me that she was surprised that Daisy was once interested in outdoor camping and hiking. She recalled one night of family camping and had the distinct impression that her in-laws were not having much fun. Daisy's family remembers visits from Helen and Lita and Lita's sons both recall visits as well. Daisy stayed in touch with the rest of the Girl Scouts and often joined the reunions. She was pictured with Helen and Mildred at Helen's house in an earlier slide. Daisy and Roy are buried in Camp Butler National Cemetery in Springfield, Illinois, Daisy's adopted city. Each of Marjorie Sparks' parents grew up in Buchanan after they married, they moved to Ishpeming, Michigan, where her father was an engineer on the Chicago Northwestern Railroad. Marjorie was born in Ishpeming. When her father died of pneumonia in 1914, Marjorie moved to Buchanan with her mother and younger sister to live with her grandparents. Her mother returned to her teaching career in the Buchanan Public Schools. We can thank Marjorie for much of what we know about the Girl Scouts. Her family donated her scrapbook and her high school diary to the local history room. When she was in her 80s, she published several articles in the Berrien County Record about the Girl Scouts and her childhood. Marjorie attended Western State Normal School after graduation 
overlapping with Lita Boyer, her close friend. They are pictured here with Marjorie's future husband, B. Leroy Gilly Gilbert, and an unknown male. The next slide is another confirmation of Marjorie's close relationship with Lita. Lita kept this note from Marjorie in her scrapbook. It reads, glad to know you are finally through, and is signed Spark and Gilbert. Marjorie and Leroy married in 1923. Leroy was a kindred spirit who loved nature. He was a successful landscape designer in the Roaring Twenties for wealthy patrons who owned estates in the Detroit area. When the stock market crashed in 1929, Leroy's landscape design business evaporated. They retreated to the family compound on Austin Lake outside Kalamazoo. Their son Bill Gilbert's book, Natural Coincidence, includes a story about their struggles during the Depression. After World War II, Leroy became the Kalamazoo Park Director and later Kalamazoo City Manager. Marjorie and Leroy's two children, Bill and Sue, absorbed their parents' love of the natural world and their mother's writing skills. Both became published and well-known and respected nature writers. Widowed at 57 and alone, Marjorie became a social worker on an Indian reservation for several years. She then returned to Kalamazoo and became a nurse administrator at Bronson Hospital. At the age of 66, she joined the Peace Corps to serve in India for two years. On vacation, she traveled to Indonesia. After she returned to Michigan, she shared her experiences at a Bukhtin reunion. Marjorie never lost her zest for life. Here she is shown in a canoe with her son, Bill. He attended several of the Girl Scout reunions and was seen hugging Dode in an earlier slide. Lita Boyer's talent as an artist was evident at a young age. Her assignment in the Girl Scouts was as their sign painter. You will see two samples of her artwork on the next slide. One painted when she was probably in high school and the other painted when she was an adult. Lita attended Western State Normal School, overlapping with her close friend Marjorie. After graduation, she returned to Buchanan and taught for one year at a one-room school on Portage Prairie. After that one year, she changed professions and worked for an architect in South Bend until after she was married. Lita was clearly a talented artist from an early age. The painting on the left was discovered in a book that was recently donated to the local history room. One on the right remains with her family, along with her needlepoint, rugs, and other works of art. In 1920, the average age that women married was 21. Lita was a month shy of her 30th birthday when she married Clarence Delwyn Kent. Her first child died shortly after birth, a tragedy she had in common with her close friend, Helen Wells Swartz. She later had two sons, one of whom, Spud, survives. He's also the last surviving child of any Girl Scout. Spud shared his memories about the Girl Scouts with me and recalled spending Saturdays washing cars at his father's Buick dealership. Spud's daughter, Julia, recalled her grandmother giving her grown-up responsibilities in the kitchen. Lita's grandsons recalled that their grandmother was a great cook. And Carol, widow of Lita's older son, Tom, provided many of the photographs for this presentation. Lita hosted several of the Girl Scout reunions, one of which is pictured on the next slide. She was active in the Buck Teens, serving as secretary and participating in the business meetings. She also traveled with her sons to Springfield, Illinois to see Daisy Richards Hill, trips that both sons remembered fondly. The Depression years were challenging for several of the Girl Scouts. However, they're shown here gathered at Lita's house toward the end of the 1930s. Lita could be called a connector. In addition to attending all the reunions, she had close friendships with many of the individual Girl Scouts. 
Her younger son, Spud, recalls that she talked to Helen every single day. Lita was widowed at 58, one year after Marjorie Sparks Gilbert's husband passed away. The strength of the Girl Scouts friendship likely provided a source of comfort in their grief. I suppose that it is natural that with eight women, one would prove a bit of a mystery. That is Allie Arney. We know she never married and was a lifelong Buchanan resident. The local history room contains the high school records of all eight Girl Scouts. Aline's records show that she took Latin, German, and French, American and world history, English composition and literature, and math and physics. She also earned high grades in all of those subjects. Although bookkeeping and other clerical classes were offered, she didn't take any of them. Did she go to college? We don't know. What we do know is that her father owned one of the grocery stores in town, and she worked at, and eventually may have managed, a local insurance office. We also know she was very organized, and a leader at her church and in the Bucktines. One of the women who knew her from church told me that Aline once pulled a teacher's certificate out of her purse to show her. Perhaps she went to a two-year normal school and earned a teaching certificate but decided that office work suited her better. It remains a mystery. Eileen was clearly a full participant in the Girl Scout adventures. In this photo, she's standing with Dode Peck next to a fancy car, probably owned by either the unknown Mark or his parents. Eileen was also a leader in the Bucktines from the very beginning. She was elected treasurer at the first meeting and either treasurer or secretary or sometimes both, many times. She attended every Bucktines reunion from 1955 to 1981. She's shown here at the 1967 Bucktines reunion with Lita and another Bucktean attendee. Elena's is on the left, Lita is in the middle, and an unidentified woman is on the right. Aline also attended most of the Girl Scout reunions. When the Girl Scouts graduated from high school, they vowed to meet every year. Although they may not have achieved that goal, there are sufficient newspaper articles and photographs to indicate that they certainly tried. In later years, after their children had left home and most of the husbands had passed away, they did achieve their goal. This photograph is from one of the later reunions. I chose it because all eight girls attended and look healthy and happy to be together again. I don't believe the Buchanan Girl Scouts ever became members of the Girl Scouts of America, although Dode was a Girl Scout troop leader in her 20s. However, their lifelong or forever friendship certainly matches the title of this slide which comes from the Girl Scouts of America website. Forever friendship is a powerful thing. By the way, Marjorie Sparks is third from the left in this photograph. The Buchanan Girl Scouts knew who they were, smart, strong, and self-sufficient from childhood. They were shaped early in their lives by family tragedies, World War I, and women's push for more opportunities and responsibilities. Throughout their lives, they cheered each other's successes, supported each other during the sad times, and gathered to share childhood memories. These eight women remind us of the joys of lasting childhood friendship. If you have stories or photographs about these women that you would like to share with me, please email me at susan.ruth7 at gmail.com. Thank you.